recently, but um, the movement to deinstitutionalize people with mental illness began in the 60s, but was, you know, in community mental health was introduced and it was a needed reform. Um, some of the campuses, St. Elizabeth's, for example, here in Washington, D.C., among many others, people could probably know their uh, institutions. If you're in mental health, you know what some of these are. They re actually resembled college Ivy League campuses. They were so well-funded and um, uh, pastoral almost uh, in, in, in that sense. And so there was a, uh, and yet they were just sort of treating, or so I would say almost warehousing mentally ill and not necessarily moving people back into the community. So community mental health took root and was um, started in the 1960s, um, cl basically closed. By the 1980s, a lot of uh, hospitals were closing or sh basically shuttered. And um, by the 1980s, it was, in my opinion, at least underfunded. So this, this expansive mm -hmm. idea, we're going to move the money for uh, mental health out of hospitals and severe care into more preventative care. A great idea. Um, states are continually to, uh, states continue to struggle with raising funds for adequate mental, mental health. Even inadequate mental health is, is barely funded. So there's a shortage of beds in hospitals um, for, for uh, people that are suicidal, for example. Um, how did we en end up here with this state of mental health care? Well, obviously, this is a subject that you'll know much better than I do, but I would say from my point of view, from the point of view of the political system, there was an intersection here of several different ways of thinking that led us down this road. I mean, I think part of it was a kind of um, ideological commitment to an idea of the individual that emphasized independence above all and tried to really play down dependence as a fact of human life. Um, and that also was anti-institutional in a fundamental way, which if you look at the, at the culture of the United States in the 50s and 60s, there's a very powerful anti-institutional strain. And it was also true that uh, institutionalization as a mode of treatment was overdone, dramatically overdone. Um, and so I think that it was at first a solution to a real problem, but it went much too far and very, very quickly because it coincided with various threads and strands in our culture. And then also with a desire to spend less money, especially at the state level. There were some people who resisted that um, on, on all sides, in all parties. Ronald Reagan, as governor of California, very much resisted deinstitutionalization um, for reasons that I think later came to look, uh, came to look rather wise. Though I, I mean, it was driven by his secretary of health and social services. But the, that, the, the commitment to reduce spending combined with a commitment to independence led us to a place where we just came to think about mental illness in a, in a way that downplayed the, the capacity of institutions to provide real services. And we've gone too far, I think much too far. Um, it wouldn't be easy to come back. I think you'd have to have a kind of revolution in how we understand mental illness um, and again, you don't want to be careful about going too far with that um, mm -hmm. because providing services in the community does a lot of good for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, there's just some people whose condition is such that it can't serve them. And yeah. that, that kind of subtlety is hard to achieve in public policy. Right. Yeah. The debate, as I've heard it often framed, often devolves into this um, idea that, well, you're giving people a handout and they're not going to really give anything back. And nobody deserves a handout unless they're going to give something back, unless they're going to earn it or, you know, so that's sort of work reform or um, welfare reform, the idea that there's, well, you know, the, and, and to your point about the, um, the rhetoric that, that we use, you know, some of the images are still lasting with people, the, the ways we paint our enemies, the way people describe the problem lasts and it leaves a lasting impression on people and some of them may not be based on facts 